I gotta hit the official button, even though we got news of why Dave's not here. Breakfast Club PT on Tuesday, March 26th. Uh, Tony Maritato, I'm Jimmy McKay, and Dave Kittle is not here right now. And I got to take this phone call because I got a delivery coming, but do you want to explain to everybody where Dave... I do. Go do it. Go, go, go. All right. So our third partner in crime, and actually, I don't even know if we have permission to say, but uh, Dave Kittle... He is waiting for a new life to enter his family. It's just an amazing time for him. And I can tell you, you know, I've got four boys. My oldest is 15. He's in high school. My twins are in seventh grade. My youngest is in fifth grade. Um, Growing up, I never knew if I'd have a family. I never knew if that was the direction I wanted to go. But once I was there, it's just the most amazing experience I've probably ever had in my life. And I, I am living vicariously through what Dave is probably going through right now. I can tell you the weirdest thing is you go into the hospital, you, your wife, you're getting ready to have this new life, uh, enter your family, and like you go through that whole experience together. And then they say it's time for discharge. And all of a sudden, <laughs> you go get the car. There's an, a car seat and you're bringing a child home. It's the weirdest thing. They just give you this baby with no instructions, no rules, nothing to follow, no user's manual. I just remember driving home three people instead of two. And it was the craziest experience of my life. Yeah. So congrats to uh, to Dave. And good luck. And there's books about that. What to expect when you're expecting. Because, I mean, people saw that and said, you have no idea what you're doing. And there's another human. Um, So that's where we are today. Um, Four seconds before we went live, Jimmy fell down the stairs at his house. Uh, I swear. A story I shared with Jimmy. I said, I fall down the stairs probably twice a year. Same, same exact situation. I'm in socks. I'm sleepy. I don't have full dorsiflexion. I'm walking downstairs and I fall down hard. My wife is like, what is wrong with you? (laughs) Nothing. It's just part of life. Yeah. So, so I had to jump off real quick because, uh, my dad's car needed to be serviced and that's stressful because when you're without a car, How are you supposed to get anywhere to get the car serviced? And something I wanted to bring up, which is happening more and more. I think people are putting themselves in their customer shoes and saying, what are their pain points? So I had an option. So Dave would love this too. Which is, hey, I I, I Googled four dealerships near me. I knew there's a bunch, but which ones are closest? Which ones were open? So the one that came up closest was first and they had their hours properly aligned on their Google page. So I called them yesterday and said, listen, you know, car needs to come in. No problem. Can you, is there a loaner? What my, but my mechanic buddy was like, make sure you always ask for the loaner. We don't have one. And I was li- literally thinking, okay, thanks. Bye. When they said, we can come pick up your car for you. And I said, oh, well that solves the problem. That solves that. So, so they have one car that they you know drive around with a driver and a second driver in it, and they're solving my problem. Instead of having to say, here's a loaner, here's a loaner, here's a loaner, here's a loaner, they're saying, we're using one truck and we keep repeating the driver. So I thought that was just an example of paying attention to your customer's pain point, making sure it was high up on the list of objections. Or make, she, she I, I didn't say, oh, I said, do you have a loaner? Right, and then the first thing she said was, we can come pick you up. Like I think she, they, whoever it was, was coached up well. I, I think we have a theme for today. You know, Jimmy and I, Dave, when he's with us, we kind of come into each morning without quite a clear picture of what we're going to talk about. But then we seem to develop this thread that flows through every topic. And I think the topic, the theme for today is solving problems in creative ways. I'm going to pitch Jimmy an idea in a little bit. He and I have not talked about this, but I want to talk about what I'm calling a fractional CCO, Chief Communications Officer, fractional CCO. But before I talk about that, staying on the theme of um, cars, car repair. So I've got 
a 2010 Toyota Highlander. It's got 172,000 miles, still runs great. It's going to be the hand-me-down car for my 15-year-old when he's ready for his learner's permit. But we just took it into the shop as well. And, and we had the same experience, just a little bit different. We took it in. We were like, routine oil change, 30 bucks, 50 bucks. Turned into a $3,000. <laughs> got to change the oil pan. Got to cut the drums and the rotors and do all this other stuff. But it's maintenance that needs to be done. But I always think about it because we go to the car dealership where we purchase the car. Right. I expect to pay a premium. I, I know that I'm going to pay more than I need to, but I will pay the premium because I don't want to deal with the mom and pop shop that I'm not sure. Are they reliable? Or is somebody going to get sick? Am I going to get my car back? Plus, we did get a loaner. So we had this beautiful 2004 Toyota Highlander that I was driving around for a couple of days while they worked on my car. Um, it's always kind of a great experience. Customer service is through the roof. Everybody is performing at the highest level from the minute you walk in the door. It's clean. They're on time. Like it's just a great experience overall. So, you know, a $30 oil change turned into a $3,000 kind of update. But again, I felt good about it. And that had me thinking about, because we always talk about investing, investing in ourselves, in our business, in our patients. Um, I'm pretty stingy. Like, I'm not a big spender. I don't spend money on anything. I've, I've been wearing this shirt 10 years. I just said I've got a 2010 Toyota Highlander that I just put money into because we're going to have it for another 10 years. But what's interesting to me is when I make big purchasing decisions, I try to reverse engineer how I got to that point, how I got to the yes, so that I could understand how a potential patient could get to that same point if I'm trying to sell a five or a $10,000 package. So we just recently committed to a $20,000 kitchen upgrade. We've been in the same house since 2006. Um, you know, we, every couple years we do a big investment. We put in like a 30 by 30 slab with a, a professional grade basketball hoop and all this other stuff a couple years back. Now we figured it's time to do the kitchen. We've gone down this road three or four times in the last decade, never committed to it, but then everything lined up. Like all the stars were in alignment. The guy came in, showed us what he wants to do, said, you know, you, you buy today, we'll do this. Like I could see all of the sales tactics that he was delivering, but none of it mattered. He, all he had to do was not mess it up. Mm. Just don't say something stupid because in our minds, we were ready to go. And I knew in my mind, I was probably looking at a $20,000 investment I think five years ago, almost the same project would have been about 12,000, but with inflation, I, I was expecting 20. Uh, he gave us the number. We said yes, and we were done. You know, there was no haggling. There was no convincing. There was no back and forth, but that's because we came in at a pain point that we needed a solution. We were sick of what we were dealing with in the kitchen cabinet situation. And we knew what we wanted. We knew what we wanted. We knew how much we were willing to pay. And as long as it came in somewhere within the ballpark, we said yes. So, so these are things that I reverse engineer to improve my business model. But I always think it's interesting. So, so talk to me about this. How did they? How did they get? How did they find you? Or how did you find them? Or how did they make sure that you found them to make sure that they had the right person with the right problem that they knew how to solve well? Yeah, they didn't find us. So this this was the solution process. And this is exactly what my clients go through. I shared an email that I got from somebody in Chicago about six hours away who found me on YouTube. This leads into what we went through, found me on YouTube and said, I'm willing to drive down. I, I need somebody's help. I've, you know, I'm eight months after my knee replacement. And I'm still not satisfied. He's got like 120 degrees and uh, flexion and full extension. He's doing great with everything. But anyway, the process we went through, um, the pain had been building. Our kids finally reached the point where they're old enough not to break everything anymore. We haven't bought furniture. We haven't done anything because they just break everything we get. Well, now they're finally old enough. They're not breaking everything. My wife got into several Pinterest pages and Facebook groups about interior design. She starts down the research 
rabbit hole. She's like, well, we can paint the cabinets, we can replace the cabinets, we can reface the cabinets. And in probably a good month or so of research, she now feels comfortable. She downloaded some AI apps that allowed her to take a picture of the kitchen, see what the kitchen would look like with different things. Um, and then she was like, okay, I know what I want. I'm going to look for a supplier locally. She reached out. She called three companies. The first one who came, they were the one we went with and we canceled the other two because we were like, we don't need more estimates. We don't need more information. We know everything we want. And these guys are capable of delivering. And that yeah. was it. So the, the so the so, so the solution process started when she was looking for con when she was on Pinterest, and it wasn't necessarily with that place or even that method of finishing the cabinets, but that's where people start looking at other people, right? Yeah, you start to get ideas. Again, the pain got to a level where we didn't want to deal with the pain anymore, and, and that it was just when I say pain in regards to the kitchen, it was the cabinet doors were loose, they were dated. We're like, we're not going to move from this house for another 20 years, if ever. This might be the house we die in. Right. So why not put the money into right. upgrading it now while we can enjoy it? We made right. that decision. And then as she starts the research process, which our patients are doing also, where do you go? You go to Pinterest, you go to YouTube, you go to Facebook, you find these closed groups, you, you see the ideas that are out there, you see what other people are doing. And then whatever resonates with you, that's what you tend to gravitate toward. Yeah. It's either active search or passive search. Like I'm Googling this, I'm searching, or I'm killing a boredom problem. And this thing happens to be placed in front of me. And typically that's not by accident. I mean, there can be some luck involved. There can be some accident involved. But typically people are playing the numbers. They're like either looking at demographics or psychographics. Demographics, how old you are sort of your like, you know, where, where you are geographically, um, how old you are, things like that. Psychographics is things you like, things about you, things that de demographics don't matter. And Pinterest is like the ultimate psychographic thing. It's sort of like it was, it was made for females and I'm using air quotes. Sure. And now the thing is just a complete monster in terms of whatever rabbit hole you want to get in. They're the rabbit holes, they're the rabbit hole of rabbit holes right. for whatever you want to get into. So it's, just, it's a smart place to be. And this is where you kind of come in. So one of the things that we see when we look across the profession, right? We, we're in a highly fragmented profession. We have tons of small providers, little practices like me. Yeah. Then we have a handful of big providers. You've got ATI, you've got Athletico, you've got NovaCare and Select. Um, and then I would say in a separate segment, you have your hospital-owned businesses, you right. know? But between those three, small, highly fragmented, your kind of larger corporate, uh, privately owned or public companies, and then you have your hospitals. None of them really, at least to my knowledge, and you might have a different experience, none, none of them are really looking at that journey again, because we're still coming out of the dark ages. We're still coming out of the time where every doctor referred every patient some are still writing. They want you to do ultrasound at, you know, 3.0 megahertz for this many minute, minutes on this body part. Like it, it's still in that world. There's still a lot of technicians with PT after their name. But as we're moving into 2024 in the future, um, I do think communications, media, I think there's huge value in this, but a lot of us can't afford a dedicated person. So Fractional CFO, Chief Financial Officer, has been around forever. And I was just doing some research before we jumped on. CCO, Chief Communications Officer, is where I think you fall into the mix. And this is where I go back to. It's like, all right, now I have no idea about finances and money and any of that. But for a CMO, Chief Marketing Officer, the numbers that I was looking at was around 200, 250,000 a year for a chief marketing officer. But when you do that fractionalized, you just divide it up right. and you're like, okay, there's going to be five companies that divide $200,000 a year across them. Each individual company doesn't have enough work, enough volume, enough profitability to hire a dedicated CMO. So they divide it out. 
but to be able to access somebody in your position, your history on radio, your connections in the community, whether we're talking about a chief communications officer dedicated to recruitment, because I think that's huge. We yeah. know that recruiters are charging 5,000 or more to get a new hire on board. Um, whether we're talking about it as bringing in new patients. So, you know, there are so many directions that that position could go. When, when we developed our original organizational chart, we had the clinical department, we had the administrative department, we had the finance department, and then we have the marketing and communications department. And right. so what are your thoughts? What do you see? Like, is this something that's viable that, that a small practice could come in with specific metrics and metrics and say, I need a fractional, fra fractional, fractional CCO. Yeah. So, so, so let me, let me uh, answer your question with a response to what you just did. You okay. just made a hand gesture for the live stream, for the podcast. You did a vertical gesture for what were the departments again? Clinical, clinical, right? administrative, finance, marketing, and communications. Here's the only difference. You did a vertical swipe every time you said one of those. In yes. my opinion, it actually looks like this. Okay. I think communications and marketing cuts across all the other verticals. That's my opinion. So I've worked with organizations where I come in as you're going to market, you're going to get us new patients or you know, further down the line, you're going to help us with talent acquisition. You're going to help us find other clinicians. And that's the thing is I keep bouncing between verticals because communication sort of touches everything. I've come in one door at organizations and next thing you know, I had a former boss and I loved him for saying this. I sort of like liked it. He's like, this feels like a Jimmy thing where it wasn't under marketing and communications, but I sort of got brought in. And I remember one time he brought me in and I go, why am I in this meeting? He goes, I want you to sit in the corner until you have something to say, until you see an opportunity to do whatever. Like, as soon as you see that opportunity, I want you to just don't even raise your hand, start talking. And that was because, in my opinion, communications and marketing needs to be baked in from the beginning. You know, I use this story if you, uh, and I don't bake a lot of cakes, Tony, but if you're baking a cake and you get to the end and the cake comes out and it's nice and fluffy or whatever, you haven't put the icing on yet and you realized, you didn't add any sugar. You forgot. There's the sugar, the cup of sugar, the three cups of sugar still sitting there on the counter. And you're like, oh my gosh, what I'll do is if I was going to put three cups of sugar in, I did it late. I'll throw 10 cups of sugar to make up for it. I'll just throw it all over the top of the cake. It's going to be a really crappy tasting cake. It just is. You haven't baked it in from the start. So you're going to overpay now. You're going to overdo it. It's still not going to be just as good. In my opinion, Sugar is the communications. Sugar is marketing. Sugar is business development, right? And spoonful of sugar makes the medicine go down, right? It gets, it gains the attention. We want people to pay attention, spend time with our organization, with our content long before they make that decision or quick before they make that decision. But somewhere in that decision making, in that cake baking process, you have to have communications and marketing as a focus. Try to slap it on at the end. It's still going to taste like a bad cake. So I think, I love your idea. Like a CMO is a new thing that I don't think I realized what it was. A C, uh, a, a, a chief, you know, uh, finance off fractional, this whole, I can't afford this one person's salary. And the person sitting home going, I'm qualified, but I don't want to work for a big company or the big companies are hiring or for whatever the reasons might be. So can I find two or three companies that could easily hire that person or afford that person and just split their time because maybe they don't have the need, but they understand having that person think about their problems 24 hours a day, because that's what happens. You get hired. You're not thinking about their problems eight hours a day. You're thinking, right? right? And the phrase that I was taught, which I sort of liked was, well, hey, we, we just want to bring you in hourly. And it's like, well, then, then you're only getting me to pay attention to you. And the entire time I'm going to be paying attention to who I'm at, who else is going to pay me hourly. So now I'm, I'm on a treadmill. I'm not focused on you. Now this is more of a transaction and less of a relationship. And the phrase that I love, it's a great quote. Somebody said, listen, I'm either working for you or I'm not working for you. Cause I don't know how to hit half a home run. Right. So if I'm only working for you, working with you when you, you know, hourly or when I'm on the clock or whatever, I don't know how to hit half a home run, but if I'm if we have a relationship and ongoing and my success is tied to your success, then I'm thinking about how to hit a better home run for you 
all day long. So I think it would work. I think the drawbacks are what I've seen anyway is um, I think I've labeled and communicated myself wrong. I think as a communications person, uh, you use the, the phrase, the cobbler's son, right? The shoemaker's yeah. son is often has the crappiest shoes. And then actually this morning I'm on LinkedIn looking for my next position and I see this quote. It's hard to read the label from inside the bottle. And I was like, damn, that's me. Because I had people close to me go, well, what do you do? And I'm like, I can do a hundred things. Right. Well, I would tell a client, don't tell, don't tell people you could do a hundred things. Tell them the three things at most that you really love to do and make sure they all sort of fit together under one problem or one general idea. So I think I've sort of just, I think I've, I think I need a dose of my own medicine because I'm inside the bottle. Yeah. I, I do the same thing. I, I cannot, when I'm looking at like, what's my next, next project, what am I doing? I can't see it. I can't see it from within. I'm too deep into it. And, and therapists go through the same thing. Like I, I think of my kitchen project, I don't want to pay some guy a hundred dollars an hour to come in and work on my kitchen because I don't, I don't understand that. I can't conceptualize that. I want to pay $20,000 to get my kitchen taken care of. Right. And, and project management has been around forever. So this is kind of that same idea. When I think of somebody like you, I think, okay, I've got a problem. I, I need a therapist. I, I can't go anywhere. I can't recruit. I know I've got this timeline. Like for us, we've got 2024, December 31st, marks the end of this level of supervision for PTAs. Well, my PTAs love the independence they have. I love the independence they have. I can be here with you because I don't have to be sitting at my clinic while they're working. And so that's going to end unless things change the end of this year. I'm going to need a therapist. I'm going to need to get the communications out there. I'm going to need somebody who could look at my organization from the outside in to understand what is my unique value proposition from that perspective. I can tell you all the stuff I want to tell you, but that doesn't mean that that's what people see looking in. And so I look at this situation. I'm like, I would make, you know, this investment um, I would expect this finished product at the end and can I, or will this person be able to deliver those results? If right. it's yes to those three things, I'm done. I'm ready. Like there's no reason for me not to do it. A couple of years ago, I bought a new website. I spent $7,000 on written content before chat GPT was around. I wouldn't spend $30 for somebody to write a single article, but when they said, we're going to give you a hundred thousand words of content, it's $7,000. I signed off and we were done because I was ready to make that investment because I knew that those 7,000 words were going to return three to five times the investment, Yeah, you know? So I, I just, I don't think it's around enough. The trouble I see is you're never, <laughs> no offense, you're never going to find that organization that's sitting around right now is like, all right, we're going to start a practice. We got to get Jimmy involved because right. we have heard that you have to get communications involved from the beginning. It just doesn't happen that way. Right. No, it's it going to be the practice that's like, we are growing, we're successful. We've got this, you know, proof of concept. Now we need to get somebody in to help us take it to the yeah. next level. I wouldn't, I wouldn't tell someone who's starting a practice to hire me. I'd be like, I'm, I'm not, I'm not the solution for you. That's where like you respectfully say, like, I don't think I'm the solution for you. Where I think I fit is two places. One is a mid-sized practice who maybe has several locations and wants to expand. They've hit a plateau. And the phrase typically is people, uh, what got you there, what got you here won't get you there. Yeah. Like whatever you've done there, you keep doing it. And now you're putting more money and not getting any, any growth. Right. And you're like, what do I do? It's like, well, you're, you're facing new problems. Now you solved all the problems to get to wherever this plateau is. And that's not a small feat. Being on a plateau is not, e you know, it's not easy to get there. Right. It's painful when you're stuck there though. And it's growth is required. The other organization I think I fit into is the massive large organizations. And I like different things about both. Uh, the smaller mid-sized organizations are fun because you get to do a lot of different things. You get to wear a bunch of different hats that has its pros and has its cons, right? You get to touch a lot of things and do a lot of things, but also a lot of things are required of you and expected of you. And that's, that can have its own, you know, fun or challenges. 
And the massive organizations have specialists already that you can sort of, two things for me, one, rely on. This person is, I can hand the baton off in this relay race and understand it's going to be, it's in great hands. And to learn from, things are changing. The world is changing. Practice changes, you know, clinical practice and business practice. Change smart in these, in these niche areas and you can learn from them and you can put your skills together and you really are this, the, you know, more than the sum of your parts. So I agree with you. You know, I think I think the changes I'm going to make in the next day or two is I've already changed my LinkedIn profile because I think people were going there and they see me as the podcast guy. And that's sort of how I presented my, myself to the world. And that's good, right? Because people know who I am and they typically know that I solve communication problems or I like communication problems. Now, my problem is they look at me as the only way that I solve the problem as a podcast. And that's that's not true, but that's my fault. I'm not communicating that. I can I solve problems for organizations in the background other way. Now I know we've talked about the communication problems that clinics have, private practices have. For me, it's recruitment and new patient acquisition. Right. But then also I got an email this morning from a company that creates robotic lawnmowers. Um, I've got a neighbor, probably three houses down, they have a robotic lawnmower. It's like those pool cleaners that go yeah, in yeah, yeah. to clean the pool, but it does the lawn. I did some Amazon videos, you know, talking about it and I've made some great commissions on it. Well, a company reached out and they said, Hey, we've got a new robotic lawnmower. It's a lower price point. We'd love for you to make a video if we send you the product. So I said, heck yeah, I'm ready for it. Send it over. Cause I haven't bought one for myself. Um, but product companies looking to step into this space. There's a couple I know right off the top of my head that have reached out to me that I've worked with before. They're going direct to consumer because they don't have a way to connect with clinicians. I'm not a good connector, so I've tried to make some of those connections, but I never really find the message that resonates. Um, but again, when I look at that fractional CCO, I, I don't just limit it to you, you working with private practices or public companies. I also look at it as, look, there's, you know, the, um, range master, the door pulley guys, they're incredible. They have such a great system. They have such a great product. I wish they would sell more expensive things because their, their profit margin is just so low on individual pulleys, right. but they've wanted to get into PTOT world for so long. And I've just never seen them make that connection and they have so much to offer. And then I look at another company, JAS, the Jazz Knee Device. It's a way to increase range of motion for somebody who has a stuck knee after knee replacement. Great family owned business, local US based company, but they just don't have communications and Dynasplints dominates the market. There are so many of these companies that I've worked with on a limited basis. And I just, I don't think they know that there's an opportunity like this for this fractional CCO position. Yeah. I think it's, I think it's still terribly new. I think it takes a while. These things, I mean, it's, even if, even if people in the know know about it, it takes a while to trickle down. I think that's the issue. Yeah. It's just like the patient who's been dealing with back pain, who just doesn't know that therapy is even an option. It's not on the radar. Uh, I go back to my wife, you know, how did she get started? She had a problem. She wanted to update the kitchen. Right. She started going to Pinterest. She started going to Facebook groups. She started go looking at YouTube videos. Um, and then as she became an educated consumer, I got to the point where she knew, okay, this is what I want. This is how much it's going to cost. This is how long it's going to take and let's get it done. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like if you wanted to, to be smart, um, and it's not fear mongering. I want to be very clear, but talking about the person's problem is typically the best way to get someone's attention, it's especially if they don't know that you exist, you personally, or that there's a person out there that exists that solves this problem, right? Did you know that there are people that you can hire that can come open and close and clean your pool? Some people will be like, well, I knew the cleaning of the pool, but I didn't realize the opening and the closing. Yeah, that's a big pain point. So likely that wasn't a thing until someone who cleaned pool was like, 
oh, this person really dislikes the opening and closing process. And, you know, where I live in the Northeast, if you mess up that closing process, you could ruin your pool. You could burst pipes. You could really screw things up. So I think things like checklists or ads that start with a question that is the person's pain point is the quickest way to get their attention. And then you need to quickly and simply walk them through the process of, if you have this, I solve this, here's how, right? $7,000 for 100,000 words, here's what you get. And the phrase that I've used before here is like, you sell the whole, not the drill, right? Sell the end point. You mean if I give you this, because already, I've already had this problem for a while, you don't need to, you know, dentists don't really need to explain the benefit of, you know, having a root canal if you've been in pain for a month. They just say, got pain, right? Come in, you know, 500 bucks or a lot more than that, 5,000 bucks and, uh, and your pain goes away. So I think talking about that before and after trend, uh, transformation is terribly important in, in, especially in medicine, especially in health, we get locked in on talking about the how too much. And maybe I'm guilty of that as well, which is like, I keep talking about the how I should talk about the pain the be the before and the after what it looks like when you're done. You know, what I think is interesting, I remember years ago, before I started teaching my zero to paid Medicare billing course, um, one of the things that we were researching was I, again, I always try to solve my own problems. And I'm looking at this, I'm like, wow, we used to outsource our billing. We got big enough that we didn't want to outsource billing anymore. We wanted control and we wanted to bring that revenue in house. So if we were at a million dollars in revenue and we were paying six or 7% for outsourced billing, that's $70,000 a year we're paying for, for a service. But I was like, how do I bring this in house? How do I make this happen? And the, the one thing that I was looking for that I could never find again, probably back to project management was a billing company that was willing to build an in-house billing department for me. I would pay them a premium on the service, but with the expectation that when they were done, we had an in-house billing department that I could then plug and play one of my in-house people who had the basic skills, but they needed to be improved and developed into that position. Right. And so again, I look at somebody like you and I'm like, well, maybe Jimmy doesn't want to work for a mid-level company that's on the upswing that's growing. And maybe that company doesn't want to hire somebody at Jimmy's level for the next 20 years. But what if there was an opportunity there to say, okay, we've got a young team. This team doesn't have the chops that Jimmy has, but if we can bring him in for 20% of his time and he's going to help us build and develop our in-house communications team. Now, even right. if I invested twice what I would normally pay the person for that position, when we're done, I've got an in-house team. I've got a built department that I can then scale and grow over the next five to 10 years. My kitchen, when my kitchen is done, I'm going to receive joy from it for the next 20 years. So it's a thousand dollar investment a year over 20 years. Right. It's not 20,000, you know, for a week of enjoyment. Right. Yeah. It's selling. I, I also think kitchens are another thing too, right? It's like, it's easier to sell tangible things because you can show a photo of what that thing looks like. And you say, you know, imagine this is why I like movie trailers in a world. Imagine, <laughs> imagine a world. As soon as you say that the person starts to do that. You know, imagine a world where your organization, your healthcare organization was in the places before someone thought they had a problem over and over again, touching them, right? Teaching them, entertaining them or both that when that person actually had the problem, you were the only, you were the first thing that came to mind before they ever Googled, they didn't Google and just take a shot at it. They typed your name or they, or even better, they remembered your jingle. We talked about jingles a few weeks ago. Uh, they remembered your jingle and the jingle included your website. So that's that's the idea, which is if you have a great product or service, you're actually you should be communicating it long before that person ever actually has that problem. You know, there's yeah. a reason Lexus advertises on billboards in Yankee Stadium. They know they're not selling any Lexuses maybe that day, but the 12 year old who's there, they've positioned themselves in a long play. That when that person goes through college, graduates, and now becomes the CEO of a company, they've understood that Lexus is, is luxury. 
and that's a long play, but there is a return on that investment. Yeah, it's it's hunting and farming. I'm always doing both. I'm always looking for that one quick kill that's going to feed my family for a week, but I'm also planting seeds along the way so that I know that I could harvest these, you know, crops next year um, if I don't have meat on the table. So, yeah. yeah. What else is going on in your world? We just got back from a vacation. I haven't done a vacation. We used to go to a cabin uh, in Hocking Hills, Ohio. Beautiful place. It's like a miniature version of the Smoky Mountains. It's got waterfalls and hikes and everything. Uh, but we're the kind of family that once we go, <laughs> we just stay in the cabin the whole time. We bring all our food. In fact, this year, I brought my Blackstone grill. I brought a cooler full of meats. We had my sister-in-law and her family come with us. And it was just an incredible time. And I am struggling. I got back last night. I am struggling to get back into work mode today. Yeah. Like this is the hardest it's been to go back to work. Yeah. I mean, I've been officially like, you know, I do projects and work with smaller companies, but like full-time 40 hours a week focused on one organization. I've been out since November. And it's yeah. scary, man. I'll tell you, like I, I've never really experienced this before. I've always sort of had a job before I left a job and went from one experience to another before I went from you know PT school. And it's uh, it's interesting when you try to switch gears because you're not switching gears from a place with momentum, or your momentum is in a different direction, right? If you're coming back from vacation, your momentum is in one direction, and now you've got to pivot. And there's a lot of energy. If you want to stay with the physics whole story there, a lot of energy required to change direction, but going from, and it starts to feel like that when you're looking for a job, it feels like you're sitting still. We have all this time on your hands, Jimmy. Are you getting a lot of stuff done? Are you, you know, and you are, you're busy, but you don't feel like you're accomplishing anything because you're not seeing any result. You're planting seeds, but you don't know if any of them are taken. Yeah. So that happens a lot. Yeah, that's, it definitely takes a certain personality. And I know there are certain days for me where I'm busy, but not getting any work done. You know, my favorite definition of work is just the straight physics definition. You need force and you need displacement. So you could put a lot of effort into something, but if you're not displacing, if you're not moving, if there's no distance happening, you are not doing any work. And I think it's a trap we fall into because we're like, oh yeah, I'm doing all this stuff and creating all this stuff and planning on all this stuff. But if you don't hit publish, if you don't get the message out there, if you don't move something forward, no matter how much effort you put in, it is not work. By definition, it is not work. And it starts to wear you down because you are tired. Right. Right. Like we're, I think we're very, very good. I, I saw this talk the other day and I don't can't remember who did it. Uh, I'm very good at quotes, but not great at who, uh, who said them. And the idea was, as adults, we're really, really good at filling our calendars. And that feels good. When I look at my calendar, it feels safe when I see a lot of different colors up there. I've got calls. One of these things might hit. Um, but that doesn't mean I'm getting any work done because, you know, uh, the other quote too, I can't remember what this is from a movie, but it was like, it's like a monkey humping a football, right? A lot of movement, but not a whole lot happening, right? So so I think I think stopping and, sell, and, and assessing a lot of times is necessary. Although it feels like pausing, it really is saying, am I going in the right direction? Is this work that I'm doing going, going to bring me somewhere? Is it bringing something to me or me to something? And so what do you do when you find yourself? Like for me, I stop, I step away from the computer. I go for a run. I go do something. I move to a different environment. What do you yeah. do when you feel yourself just kind of spinning wheels? What should I do or what do I do? What in the do last couple. What, yeah, what have I been doing the last couple of weeks? Nothing. I've been law of diminishing returns. And I know this, right? We say this and we don't, we say the advice, we give advice, but we don't take it. What I typically like to do and have been doing that is successful. I call people and I talk about, I try to talk about anything else. Like I call, yeah. so how was your, like, how was your weekend? What did you do? Like just friends, like people I really trust. And the goal is not a connection or a sale or a job or anything. It's literally like, I need to, I just need to connect with a human. So I do that as much as I say in the next 30 minutes, I'm going to go ride the Peloton or I'm going to go for a drive. or I have coffee here, but the act of going to get coffee for me is like bumps me into humans and just puts me in a different space. But it's funny is when those things aren't working, you stop doing the good things we notice. Right. Did you watch yesterday or listen to yesterday's My First Million podcast? I didn't. No. What was the topic? 
Well, it's bringing this around to Dave's situation. Yeah. It is very timely. They were talking about solving problems in creative ways. They were talking specifically about um, fertility, pregnancy. Uh, one of the things that they were looking at and talking about was kind of a hot topic that's getting very um, polarizing for people. It was a company, there, there's been fertility issues in the US at least, if not globally for years now. Nobody quite knows why, everybody has their ideas. But one of the things that we know is that it's getting more difficult to get pregnant, to have a baby. And so a company came out and they said, we will freeze a woman's eggs at the prime of her life um, and we'll do it for free because it used to be like ten thousand dollars to right. harvest and freeze a woman's eggs. But we'll do it for free. We'll have them ready when you meet the man, or, you know, partner of your choice. Um, everything will be ready for you. And so they were talking about how could they do it for free? Well, the value exchange here was we'll harvest the eggs, but we're going to get ownership of half of them. And then we're going to sell our half of the eggs to other couples that want to have babies. And the wow. money generated from that will pay for the cost of your harvesting and your storage. Wow. Uh, but I was just thinking like, again, there are so many creative solutions, whether you think of this as a good thing, a bad thing, indifferent to it. Uh, there are so many creative ways to solve problems for people. Somebody has a problem. Somebody wants to develop a solution. How do we bring those two parties together? Yeah, that that was sort of an advantage in radio. Like when I first when I first took over the radio station, I, the last radio station I worked for and eventually ran, I had a boss and boss moved on. And then I stepped up and luckily, you know, had earned the trust of a GM to run the radio station. And now I got to sort of see behind behind the curtain, behind the curtain, right? Like all the, all the secrets. And I realized, I asked, well, what's our marketing budget for this radio station? And this radio station earned five to $7 million a year. It was in gross, like not bad for a Northeast Pennsylvania radio station. And our marketing budget was $0. And I remember thinking, you're messing with me. This is like a hazing ritual. What are you talking about? We are a company that sells attention. How do we have no budget for gaining the attention? And he said, your operating budget is your ability to gain attention. We pay your FCC license. We pay your licensing for um, to, to be able to play commercial music on the radio. You have to do stuff with that. So where this goes is if I wanted to do a t-shirt giveaway campaign, what this meant was I needed to have the idea that was so good that Coors Light wanted to buy it, put their name on it, and then a portion of that, whatever we earned, could pay for the t-shirts because the idea was bigger. It would truly was solve the problem. Okay. We have these, we have, you know, women who want to do this, but they don't have the money, but there's a lot of them out there. So now we're working on volume. And then how can we, how can we leverage some of those things? I mean, there's some ethical implications, right? Like, is this okay? Is this right? Like, um, but for the right person, it is right. Yes. I, I see, I see the exchange. And for me, this is out of reach for the harvesting and, and the freezing of the eggs and the containment out of reach for me, but I need this. So I'm willing to concede something. So that, that, that $0 marketing budget actually made me really, really agile. I had to get creative. So a lot of times I'd walk in, you know, I would never ask what's the budget. I would say, what's the problem? What are the things you have around? I would reference that scene from Apollo 13 where they got to build the air filter and we need to build a, a filter that fits a hole with this using nothing but this. And you have to get very, very creative. But that's the thing. You're in the creative. Everybody says they're a creative problem solver. That doesn't mean I know the best place to Google to get the problem solved. It could, but it could also be finding um, untraditional solutions for traditional problems or vice versa. So if somebody, and I know we're getting close on time. So if somebody is out there listening to this and they're like, we absolutely have a communications problem. We have amazing clinicians. We have amazing treatment protocols. We have an amazing culture and community within the clinic. Everything is there. What we don't have is the way to communicate all of this to the general population, to our specific patient demographic, to our ideal client. Um, that person who's sitting out there right now, listening to this 43 minutes in, 
uh, 44 minutes. Hey, I guessed, and I was so close to guessing it right. <laughs> what, what is, what's the next step for them? Like they didn't even know you were yeah. available for something like that. Yeah. How, how yeah. do they connect? Yeah. Any of the social platforms I love, as you mentioned, what do I do when I get stressed out or don't feel like I'm making progress? I talk to people and I like talking to people with problems and I don't think I have secret sauce. I want to say this again. I don't have secret sauce. I just have experience doing it in, in solving problems in non-traditional ways. So I don't think I'm ever, I'm a phone call. I'm not going to be able to tell someone something. Or I'm going to hold back for fear that they're going to take the idea and give them and run. If it was sure. that simple, they probably, they're smart enough. They would have done it already. So I like connecting with people who have similar problems. I like it in healthcare because I truly believe in the product and service we provide. So I would say, you know, email me, Jimmy at ptpinecast.com or at ptpinecast on all, all the socials or shoot, I flash my phone number on the screen half the time when we're trying to take phone calls from the audience. So, um, so yeah, reach out and let's figure out, let's figure out how to get rid of that, that main problem. Cause things that you, you highlight the two biggest problems right now, or at least what we think of the two biggest problems in healthcare which is getting patients or getting clinicians. Those are people problems. Those are communication problems. You don't have an Indeed problem. Indeed's not working. That's not where your audience is, or maybe you're not using it right. I don't know. But let's look at all the different ways you're trying to solve the problem and figure out why they're not working. Yeah, and, and I think what you should do, which I've started to do, is record those calls because those calls are coming from people that have real problems that there are probably a hundred other or a thousand other people with that exact same problem. And so the value exchange there is you record the call, you share the call, you let other people know, you know, what that conversation was like. Um, after this, I'm jumping on a call with somebody. I think this is kind of interesting. I shared this definitely in Facebook, maybe on LinkedIn. Uh, we've seen all of the AI documentation programs that are coming out yep. and they're like, and I don't know if you remember this, I, I swear I was talking to you. We talked about AI when it was just getting started, chat GPT. And I said, look, if you record the audio from a treatment session and you transcribe that chat GPT can read that and turn that into a note. Well, within weeks or months, not because of that episode, um, these AI companies were coming out with exactly the same thing. You record your treatment session audio and the software will process that into a treatment note for you. Yep. Uh, this individual reached out to me. He was referred to me by other clinicians that we know. And he was like, hey, this is what I'm working on. And he's actually a YC, Y Combinator member or cohort. He's involved with that in some way. And so I was like, oh, okay, well, tell me what's going on. And he's showing me his stuff and great stuff. Nice. But I'm like, this is, this is coming from the wrong perspective. I'm like, I understand because he has no connection to the therapy world. I said, how did you know, or why did you think about physical therapy? He's like, well, I had shoulder pain one time and I saw a therapist. So I'm like, you're, I would say you're doing what everybody else has already done. You're approaching this to solve the therapist's problem. The problem is <laughs> there's not much money behind solving the problem for the therapist. We need to solve the problem for the practice, for the person paying the bill. I said, there is, to my knowledge, no AI program or platform that has processed all of the publicly available data from Medicare. Medicare tells us what they want for documentation. Medicare shows us what they want when they do a Medicare audit. There's a 19 point checklist that Medicare makes available that none of the AI documentation systems has trained their AIs on. I'm like, go to every insurance company first, train your AI on the published guidelines that they have for that specific insurance company. Then go to the reviewers, go to the utilization managers, go to the people that are actually reviewing the documentation, train on what their guidelines are, because they're the ones making the decision on, is this going to get paid or not? Go down the list, go to the compliance people, look at, is this a compliant, you know, medical record, blah, blah, blah. Then at the very bottom of the list, go to the therapist and say, what would you like us to deliver? And now what you've got is you can put it all into a guideline, a framework that is compliant, that follows state and federal guidelines that will be paid for by the insurance company. Oh, 
and also saves the therapist time. You know, but the reality is you're asking people at the front lines, the therapists who really don't even know what the Medicare requirements are, what the compliance guidelines are, what the HIPAA privacy policies are. They just know what their pain points are, but solve their pain points. And it doesn't mean you have a solution that's going to get the insurance to pay the claim. So we're jumping on another call today. He invited me to kind of join the project. And I was like, no, there's no way. I don't have time. I don't have bandwidth. Um, but I'll put you in contact with the right people because I'm not even the right person. It's way above my pay grade. Yeah, but it's understanding the, the life cycle of the, we talk about patient life cycle or customer life cycle, but it's the it's the problem life cycle, which is where does this problem actually start? I yeah. mean, as you were as you were describing that to me, I was thinking of the idea of people didn't want electricity or cars. They wanted faster horses and brighter candles, right? So, right. but selling brighter candles, right, is a transaction, but selling the selling a completely different thing, well, that that created and transformed an industry. Well, created an industry. There was no, you know, there was no light bulbs. Yeah. And we talked about this last week at some point. We we're like, you can't fight a Goliath head on. Um, uh, liquid death doesn't go directly at Pepsi and Coke with another version of Pepsi and Coke. No. They come at it from a completely different angle. You create a new space adjacent to what is going on right now. And so if all the other AI companies are approaching it in one way, you zig when they zag. And I think it's the same for us. Like I just shared last night, there used to be an infographic floating around that was promoting cash PT. And it said, look, if you see a cash physical therapist, you're going to save money and you're going to do fewer sessions and you're going to do all of these things. And I'm like, that is not the way to fight against a third party reimbursement system. Right. We need to go a completely different direction, show the benefit, not the features. Those are all features you were listing. It right. was, you're going to get fewer sessions. <laughs> that doesn't sound appealing to most people. They want to get what they need, not less than the, what they would have gotten through insurance. Yeah. Um, all of these other things, it's a LinkedIn post. Maybe we'll talk about it next next session. But what would be your parting shot? Parting shot is sometimes you got to take a, a good hard look at yourself and say, maybe I'm doing something the wrong way. And even if, you know, again, I heard that, I read that quote this morning. It's It's hard to read your own label when you're inside the bottle. Yeah. Um, but that's where I, you know, uh, to, to also pair it with what I do when I get stuck or frustrated is sometimes you have to ask people, what do you, people you trust and people who know you well enough, what, what value do you think I bring? And tell me about me in a good, in a good way, which has helped me learn. And some of those lessons, some of those things are going to say are going to be hard to hear because you felt like you were doing the right thing the whole time, but maybe you weren't. So I think, uh, sometimes it's the man in the mirror and sometimes it's the friend around friends around you. Yeah. And I, and I think it goes back to when the consumer is ready to buy, they're ready to buy. You just got to put it in front of them and they're going to say yes. And it could be a $20,000 offer. It doesn't matter. It's just how do you communicate to that person when that person is ready to make the purchase? Yeah. All right, Tony, appreciate the time. Maybe we'll have Dave back uh, later on this week on Thursday. Same bat channel, same bat time. See you guys.